Well, hi guys, thanks for joining us. I'm in London, Liverpool, en route to pick up the truck. Welcome back to the channel. Well, it has been a while. Um, and we thought it was about time that we updated you on what was happening. We've had a lot of people asking us uh, over the last weeks in particular what is happening where you're at. So, Izzy, give us an update. Over to me. Um, okay, so uh, you may remember back in September we set ourselves a, perhaps with a bit of hindsight, a ridiculous challenge of building a new overland truck um, for under £100,000 in less than 12 months. Um, so we decided that that challenge would start at the end of December uh, and we're now well into January and uh, apologies for the delay of the video but it's been manic. Phil? It has. So we bought an MAN TGM 4x4 back in September. Now we were actually in crash at the time and I bought it blind. So what I mean by that is I was going to fly back, have a look, um, but at the time I, I had a video walk around or a, a number of video walk rounds uh, with the guy, guy back in Wales, and I was satisfied that the vehicle was okay. It's ex environment agency, so a new you know government organisation. It would have been well serviced and pretty well looked after. We come back in December. No, late November. Sorry, we come back late November with the view to picking the vehicle up early December, and so that was exactly what we did and went down to Wales and when I picked the vehicle up it wasn't right so I went out for a drive, I checked it over, it looked fine pretty much what I was expecting, T took it out for a drive and it was blown black smoke, it was driving perfectly I just couldn't understand it so back to the dealership, uh, cut a long story short I stayed a second day, they got an MAN independent specialist out who looked at it Well my guys, I'm at yard well the man guy in this white van is here linked up uh, to the truck, uh, just have a look at it, um, putting it through a test to see what's happening. And they basically, you know, the initial thought was it was the EGR valve. And in fairness, it had been stood about for a few months and the EGR valve had actually seized on. So that was, was freed off and the MAN basically said, look, hard to say, yeah, it's driving perfectly. Um, it probably just needs a good drive. So I made the decision to take it with me because it was driving faultlessly really and drove all the way back from Wales back to Norfolk I put it into the garage and I had been speaking to my it's a, it's a, basically it's a big garage back in Norfolk um, whilst all this was happening um, and we decided just to sort of come back and, and have a look at it. Whilst so we dropped it off and whilst all this was happening, it was the lead up to Christmas we and were, we had planned to see family yeah, and friends. We were all over the country visiting people, obviously yeah. the lead up to Christmas, there were parties and it was just a really, really busy time and we didn't really do any work, did we? We, we were catching up on, a, on the year that we'd been away really. Yeah, um, and I had been speaking to the guy in the garage to understand, try and understand what it was and they were obviously scoping out what it could be, looking at all the small stuff, uh, trying to get some sort of diagnosis, a bit of head scratching actually in fairness, and uh, the, the guy that I go to, you know, served his time with MAN, he's been in this game for 30 years, and he said, look, we, we really are sort of uh, a bit stumped here, spoke to MAN, so, no, it's fairly unusual, but again, the cut a long story short, they narrowed it down basically to two of the injectors, so painfully, Annoyingly, we had to replace all six injectors, and that solved the problem. And it is driving perfectly. And we did we did have money in the budget for mechanics. We knew that we might have to do some work. Yeah. I think it was quite a bit more than we had in the budget, though. So that was a, a bit of a shock, really, and not not the start that we wanted in terms of the the budget. Definitely, no, the budget was tight anyway. Um, and whilst we was in the garage, the guys actually um, we talked about removing the exhaust. The exhaust came up the back of the cab vertically and so we chopped that off and now it sort of discharges under the cab so uh and that's because we didn't want lots of black smoke going across the yeah top of the I, I quite like it up there box. particularly for water crossings and so on but it just, it just we just couldn't make it work how deep do you think we're going to go deep deep <laughs> okay um okay so then we get into so we get back we pick a truck up it's all good um early january 
we put a little tonka in for a service and an MOT, pass yeah. flying colours, of course it did. But we're trying to juggle two trucks. As yet, I can't drive either of them, so Phil was backwards and forwards, I was following him in the car um, with the two trucks, but but now they're both where they should be. One's in the fabricators and one's stored safely away Yeah. Um, in, a, in a nice little field. Yeah. So this video really is all about the new build. That's just a little bit of an update. Yeah. It's all about uh, wh where we got to, how we sort of progressed with it. And basically we picked it up early January, put it into our fabricators. It's a, they're a small family run business. They're incredibly innovative in their thinking. They're very sort of, solution focused. Very solution focused, very sort of frugal in their approach, which suits us really mm. well. That's what we like. And uh, the biggest piece of work really was the to get it going really was a subframe and we always knew that we were going to go for a rail on rail subframe um, really from a sort of design point of view from a sort of layman's point of view it was always going to be the easiest uh, to to execute really and so I after a lot of research I ended up copying a design from Oscar Overland um, he's a top man if you if you don't watch Oscar Overland Check him out. If this is your scene, have a look. He's a really good guy. And uh, I obviously made the subframe to fit our vehicle. Uh, it's a bit longer. He's on a Mercedes, shorter wheelbase. So I designed it basically around that. I'm really happy with it. Uh, I think it's the, the guys of, um, they're sort of 95% yeah. there with the subframe. Yeah. It's basically been fabricated. We're just at the point of understanding what needs to get sort of bolted to it or what's mm. going to get fixed to it, like the rear tool bins, um, before it goes and get, gets galvanised. But while all this was going on, and Phil was with the fabricators every day because it was part of the process, he wanted to um, sort of see what they were doing and they wanted his advice and guidance about the specifics that we wanted. We were also trying to source a box, uh, a habitation box. So mm. a, a big part of the area where we think we can save money on the budget is by not buying a, a, a made to measure, if you like, a, a fabricated box. We think uh, we can buy a box that comes from the back of a refrigerated lorry and that our fabricators are happy to uh, chop that down to size and, and rebuild it for us, basically. So it's one of the biggest questions that people have asked us right from the off. Who's building your box? Mm. And it is a big deal. Box at the minute of that size, it's 5.7 meters long, or it's going to be 5.7 meters long. It's somewhere between sort of 20 and 25 grand, depending on who builds it for you. That's that's with a door. That's not with windows. So it's a really big cost. It's, it's a, it, well, it would be 25% of our budget, and that was just too much. Um, it would have pushed us way over the the, the place that we wanted to be. Um, so we were up and down the country looking at various boxes. Well, this actually started back in. December mm. um, we looked at about 15 to 20 boxes all over the country looking at some real rubbish um, we, we looked at every sort of ex Tesco ex Sainsbury's of course there are other supermarkets but all of their, yeah. their ex boxes and the bottom line is a lot of these boxes are you know they, they've been sort of built for a purpose and they've, but they're pretty much on the whole they're all battered and used, used and abused yeah. damping and them and water ingress mm. and thought wow have we made a monumental error <laughs> we did think that because uh, we just couldn't see anything that was right yeah um, and the amount of work to strip back what we would have needed from one of those boxes and, and then the amount of work required um at the paint shop to get it ready to be sprayed would have been phenomenal well um, inside and out yeah. so I, th I think we were very fortunate uh, i was on the hunt every single day and something came on the market uh, if you're wondering where to look and a few people have contacted us that would be ebay mm. that we we were on ebay that's really the only place we but i look. rang lots of yards uh who sort of specialize in this sort of thing and you know one came on the the market and given that we had looked at so so many boxes and knew the standard of those boxes i thought this is a bit different and it was a box that's just a bit bigger than what we need uh, so you haven't got a lot of waste uh, it was near stoke on trent it's very clean and i went there had a look and immediately thought this is for us there is nothing else on the market like this uh yes of course it's got to be chopped down that's fine but it was it belonged to a private butchers they had two vehicles clearly took pride in, in their vehicles yeah, both of them were actually were full of aluminium shelving but i could see beyond that and thought actually yeah, these are in really, really good order. 
it did have a fridge unit on the front of it which obviously we need to fill in but we've got enough excess material mm -hmm. to do that and make good so yeah we 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 paid more so to give you an idea these box selling you know thousand pounds thereabouts some are 700 some are 1500 this was an awful lot more because of that fridge unit um so i he wasn't going to separate it so we had to buy the whole lot but we, we think we might be able to sell the fridge unit independently so claw some of that money back yeah um, um luckily the first haulier that i rang who was based um near where we are in norfolk could pick it up in two days time so they were pleased to get rid of it we were pleased to have it um and so now now we have that so that's a big part of the jigsaw yeah um that we've actually got that we've actually got in place yeah so yeah, it took me a bit of a bit of a mission to, to get the shelving out, but there we are, we have a box. Yeah. Yet to be cut down, but we have a box. Just to give you an idea of the the, the list of work that I've asked them to do, uh, I've written it down because I won't remember. We talked about the subframe. Uh, cutting the box down to size, I've touched on that. The step platform arrangement, uh, which is going to be very similar to yeah. what we have here. We like it, we're going to keep it, or something similar. The tool bins, so we bought some tool bins, but mm -hmm. some of the tool bins are going to be fabricated uh, particularly around the rear because you just can't buy them in that shape. The motorcycle rack, the cab roof bars, and lots of little jobs here and there, um, the fabrication of the waste tank. But, but we do actually, we have also got a couple of real key dates booked in um, for several months time when the truck will go into the paint shop uh, and then from there it will come out, will be with us for a week and then it will go into the, um, uh, well, it'll go across to the electrician who's going to do the first fix with all the Victron gear for the solar, but also the um, all the internal wiring. So there are some things that are set in stone, and yeah. I think that we feel that we're probably on target for those yeah. things right now. I think one of the things we learned from, so we've developed build properties, and what we've taken away from that, I used to do all the work myself, and one of the things we really sort of took away from from that process, I suppose in hindsight, is yes, it's going to save you money, but it's going to take an awful lot longer. Mm. And you know, sometimes, you know, giving the the truck to to a electrician or giving the truck to a, a bodybuilder to do a specific bit of work is actually money well spent. If you get Absolutely. it at the right money, mm. you know, it, it's worth it. So but we're, ma we're, I suppose, we're sort of like the project managers, aren't we? We're managing yeah. that whole process, booking things in. We're sourcing. The, the right people that we want to work with, people that we like, that we connect with, who get what we're trying to do. Um, I'm very fortunate the guys allow me to, to work there and it, you know it really is sort of physical yeah. work all day long. And that's great for me. It means that I am there, I can answer questions, I can, I can help get my vision across to the, to the guys yeah. actually doing some yeah. of the work. And that's really, really important. They haven't done a project like this before, so it's brand new to them. And so... As much as we've, we've sort of lived in the truck and we know exactly what we want our new truck to look like, they ne don't necessarily yeah. sort of have that, that, that vision. They're very, very good at sort of, you know, pitch a pinch a thousand yeah. words and sometimes even just showing a couple of images of other trucks to say, this is really what we're looking for, maybe with a little minor tweak here and there, and they get it. It's been a really interesting time though, hasn't it? It's been, mm. it's been really exciting. But it's actually been quite stressful at times, particularly when we're trying to do lots of different things. And I think the, the moment when we sort of pushed the button on ordering the windows and the door and the roof light, that was it. Because once there, you know, there's no going back there. You have to pay up front. The door has to fit wherever it's going perfectly uh, and everything else that you've planned has to fit I just want to say, I've, I've got written down here. So at this stage of the game... The design process is absolutely yes. key in all of this. It really, really is. And everything, every decision that we're sort of making, um, not just sort of spending money, but every, you know, the door is a really good yeah. example. You know, getting the door in the right place. So if you sort of work, we're working back, so working from the, our bed is going to be to the rear, very similar to what we have at the yeah. moment. And then we're going to have our shower cubicle, we're going to work forward, we're going to have our sort of kitchen area. Um, and those units are a certain size, working all the way forward to the seating area. So if you get the door in the wrong place, it could be it could be encroaching mm. into the kitchen space. So it's and then from there, exactly the the size of windows that you need, because you've got to think about how high it's going to be and where the mm. windows are going to be positioned and so on and so on. It has been a real time of engaging, yeah. researching, and yeah. trying to understand. I suppose in your mind's eye exactly how it's going yes. to look and so 
Izzy came up with, uh, we knew exactly the layout we wanted, and Izzy spent some considerable time actually designing the, mm. the layout, if you like, the internal layout on Canva. Yeah, it's a tool I use for the, for the website to create pins and, and do graphics and things. It's not designed as a, as a CAD tool at all, but actually it works in pixels and you can create one pixel equals one millimeter. And so we were able to draw a floor plan and a couple of elevations. It's not 3D, but it's good enough for us because we can visualize what it's going to look like. Ultimately it was, was to, to scale. Yes, it is to scale, yeah. Uh, and then we met some people Yes, who were able to do a CAD drawing for us, so that was really super helpful. Cheers, Thank you ben. very much. Um, but I think it's a. I think anybody that's been through this process or done anything similar will recognise that all the big costs are, are very, very, very heavily loaded to the front end of the build. Yeah. So the windows they have to be ordered well in advance because of the lead time. The the. Um, so quickly, we are going with outbound windows yeah. again from the Netherlands. Yeah. All the electronic stuff, the Victron kit, that's that's had some really good price reductions recently because of the price of lithium coming down. But they're they're looking to probably have an increase at the end of March this year, so we wanted to get that order underway. Um, and then the other the other big cost is um, what is the other big cost, Phil? <laughs> I've lost track of what I'm saying now. <laughs> There's just two or three really big chunky costs that have to come out of the budget right at the start. Well, paint is a good example. Yeah, and you um, want to make sure you get them right, you know, and with. We've been grappling with the colour of the outside of the truck. Oh, don't even go there. We've gone from sandy coloured to pink, to peach, to green, to paler green, to greyish. Um, I think we're settled now, but we're gonna we're, we're not gonna quite share that. We're gonna have a big reveal at some point when we share that. Um, yeah, we're not hundred percent yet. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, so yeah, as well as that, um, I just want to say in, in in the middle of all of this. And if you've done a build yourself, you'll totally get it. In the middle of all of this, so I'm at the yard every day. Izzy's keeping on top of the website as well. Uh, we come back and then we sort of regroup in the evening. And it's all about research. It's all about trying to understand, mm. right, what do we need? What do we, what do we need to tee up in terms of materials or component parts uh, to progress with the build? A good example is uh, the treads, the whole sort of platform thing. So trying to understand how that was going to work. So that's sort of one example. Send the units. Uh, and people, do you know, people have been so lovely. The number of people that yeah. we've, we've rang and said, can you give us some advice about this? Or can you help us to understand what this is? Mm -hmm. And people are very, very generous with their time, yeah. um, willing to understand. Um, and actually, once most people find out what you're doing in the, the project, they're, they're, you know, they think that's amazing. Yeah. They, they really enjoy the fact that they're, they've been so, somehow involved in that. I'm not going to go on about springs because I think I'll talk about subframes. Oh God, don't talk about springs, please. I'll talk about subframes and why have you gone with a real on real in a different video, but honestly... But um, did you know a spring could be square? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so I'll, I'll talk about that, but uh, yeah, springs. I spoke to some wonderful people, some real geeks when it comes to spring technology and uh, spring You've engineering. You've actually become a spring geek yourself. Yeah, so anyway, let's, <laughs> let's move on. Um, Sorry, one of the other things that we have, we will be changing, is the fuel tank as well. Oh, yes. So, we love eBay. We've always loved eBay. And we have a 200 litre tank on the truck, on the new truck. The standard tank, which, which just isn't big enough. So, I managed to source another tank, which came off a Mercedes. Beautiful aluminium tank, but again... 380 litres, but by the time I was going to buy the sender unit, which was another 170 quid, brackets uh, and so on, it just wasn't going to work. It, it just it, it just didn't make any economic sense. So I managed to find a 600 litre fuel tank that came off an 18 ton MAN, and it did a deal for 250 quid, which is an absolute bargain. You know, these fuel tanks are like 1300 quid. So that was a real steal. Mm. So, so what we're going to we're going to what's the repurpose the other fuel tank that we built yeah uh, bought as the as the wastewater tank the grey water it's tank. It's a grey tank, and again our fabricators are really happy. Yeah. We've actually bought the sending unit for that yeah. already. Uh, sending unit is going to talk to the Victron because we're going to have a servo, and so it's all these little decisions yeah. that you're trying to sort of think. And when the the vehicles at this point where we have the cab chassis and the subframe. You're then looking for space, and even before the subframe was was uh, fabricated, we were looking at exactly how is that going to leave us in terms of space within that chassis carcass, if you like, to house things like an LPG tank. 
yeah, we are going to have gas, but we're also we're only going to have gas for cooking. So mm. we'll have an outdoor grill and we'll have a gas cooker. But we'll also have a well, we'll have a mix mixed hob induction slash yes. gas um, because we like cooking on gas. We do, but also it just gives us options. So yeah, it's, so there's all of that. It's it's at that sort of position the, the, the sort of camp chassis with yeah. the subframe and we're looking at exactly how we can best utilize all the little sort of spaces uh, within the uh, within the sort of chassis rails okay something I've got really excited about is the wheels um, only you could get some well, of wheels yeah so the truck has uh, a dual wheel on the rear we decided as, as part of the sort of the overland build that we would buy a, a very specific set of wheels. They're, they're steel bolted wheels. They can take five and a half thousand kilograms. Uh, I think they're a thing of beauty. We've only just got three of them on actually, mm. uh, which I'm really, really pleased to buy. I mean, already it's just changed the whole sort of presence of the vehicle. And the good news is that I, I thought for you know a short time that we might need spacers or we might need to make some sort of modification, but actually they went straight on. They cleared the hubs. They, you know, in terms of steering, there's no impingements, uh, so that was really good news. So, uh, might have to adjust the uh, the stoppers a little bit, but you know, it's I, a really I have good to start. say, I know nothing about wheels, but they do look good. Yeah, and we've gone with Continental tires one because they're a bit cheaper than yeah. the uh, Michelin um, XLs that we used to run on this truck, but they've just got so so expensive. Um, and I do begrudge spending mm -hmm. that, that much money on wheels. So yeah, really happy with that, about that. One of the other questions is, why a truck? And it's a fair point, you know, because they're expensive to run. They're, they're particularly for, for Europe, they're large, you can't go everywhere in them, but that's not really what it's about for us. And we've traveled for five, five and a half years around Europe and we have by no means exhausted Europe and we love Europe, but we do want to go further afield and we want to travel slightly differently. And we really, really enjoy the sort of truck life, if I can use mm. that term. We enjoy the security. We enjoy the, the space, the capacity. I think that off-grid capacity yes. is incredible. You're never going to get that in a motorhome. The, the ability to, to get that last 5% yeah. on those difficult tracks and roads. Yeah. And then, and then maybe sit there for 10 days. Yeah. And that's what we really like. But the reality was we really wanted to do a self-build. And we did look at doing a, a sprinter, a 4x4, but we can't, we can't build a sprinter, not a 4x4 anyway, no. for what we can build a truck for, which is absolutely crazy. Mm. Um, but we, yeah, we just, we just like the capability of it, I suppose, from an off-grid perspective, from an off-roading perspective. One of, the, one of the sort of the big draws really is we, we love motorcycling. We used to tour by motorcycle mm. and we can see ourselves doing that again. And so we thought, well, if we had a, a truck carrying a slightly bigger motorcycle, then we could, you know, it's very easy in Europe to park, find secure parking. Mm. Um, it's pretty cheap. And we see ourselves parking the truck up, taking the motorcycle, disappearing for a month or two months, whatever. And, uh, and just sort of, you know, particularly in the summer yeah. months, and I might even be able to get rid of Phil for a bit. Yeah, it'd be great. So <laughs> on a solo trip, guys, you can imagine, I'm absolutely buzzing by that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and it might be the case that, you know, sometimes Izzy's not keen on doing a particular track. Yeah, I just, I, I, that's what I don't like. Look at the face on that. She's absolutely loving this. She's just not, she's pretending. And actually, there's there's a question mark whether or not we can take the truck on the yes. truck. And we've had that a number of times. Yeah, we have. Usually because of height or, you know, it's big enough. It's a donkey track and it's big enough for a Land Rover, but nothing bigger. But you don't know the condition of it. And we've seen this a number of times. Yeah. But to be on a motor, for me, to be on a motorcycle, I was brought up with Enduros and dirt bikes. And I love all that. It's right up my street. Why not left-hand drive? We did want the left-hand drive. Mm -hmm. And that was really that was quite important, actually, because it isn't every country in the world that you can drive a right-hand drive vehicle in and we do spend most of our time abroad but we just couldn't get one we couldn't we could get one and we could get no, some not great examples budget. nowhere near within the budget though and we did actually speak to a number of people at the overland show at bad kissingen last year who said yeah we can actually source vehicles but by the time we looked at it 
uh, you know, even sort of vehicles that were sort of 30 and 40 years old, which mm. would have been ideal with very low mileage, they were still at sort of 40 or 50 euros. But this time we got back yeah. into the UK, you know, and paid the taxes um, and, and so on. And it, it just really for the budget, it was it a was, non-starter. Yeah, it was, totally. Tires, yeah, people always sort of say, how much do the tires cost? Well, I'll give you an idea. The tires cost about 850 pounds, maybe 900 pounds, depending where you are in Europe. For the Continentals, the the Michelins, the Michelin equivalent are about sort of 1200 quid, 1250. Mm. Uh, so it's a huge amount of money. And so you've, if you're going to embark upon a project, you've really got to factor in all these yeah. all these but, but, big costs. But when we put tires on on Tonka, we, they're all changed now for brand new tires. We had bought new for old stock, so they not new for old. What are they called? New old stock. Yeah. So they'd never been used on a vehicle, but they've been on a shelf for a long time, and we paid the price for that. If, if you don't know that, go back and watch our first year of travelling in the truck and see how many flats that we have and how many tyre problems we have. Yeah. We've really learned that lesson. So we've got brand spanking new tyres, brand spanking new wheels, all lovely. Yeah, and that is pretty much it. There is one thing I just want to mention. I'm going to do a shameless plug here. If you've been wondering what I've been doing while Phil has been um, faffing about with tyres and <laughs> steel and things, I've been creating our own merchandise. So if you're thinking that we're looking rather lovely today in our attire, it's because this is the Gap Decaders merchandise um, with our little tagline, today, not tomorrow. Uh, so take a look. We'll put a, uh, a link down below. Um, and if you wanted to support us, it would be great if you wanted to buy something and wear it with pride. That was shameless. It was, totally. But there we go. Okay. Shall I mention the cookbook as well? Or is that a step too far? No, it's too far. Okay. Okay, guys. <laughs> Listen, uh, I know it's been a while. Uh, we are going to try and get something out every two weeks. Yeah. Uh, somebody said to me before we started, in fact, there was a guy I met at the Overland Show who had actually, you know, he he has a YouTube channel and he filmed his, bit, his build and he said to me, if you film it, it's going to take it twice as long. Yeah. And I can completely get it. I just don't have time during the day to film all the the sort of technical aspects and the thought process and talking to the cameras, setting up the, the tripods and I just haven't got that time. I would really, really love to do that, but there just isn't time to do that. No. So unfortunately, I know lots of people have said film every little aspect of it, but the bottom line is we're actually trying to get this project completed by October at the latest. I don't know if we can do that. Uh, that. That would bring us in way earlier than we thought. It, it, and you've said it now. You've jinxed it. You've said it on film. You're going to hold me to that now. I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and obviously there's an awful lot of testing to do uh, between now and then. You know, there's testing, you know, in the next sort of week or two in terms mm -hmm. of the subframe. So all of that testing dynamic loads and so yeah. on in terms of sort of when it's all built. So there's an awful lot of work to be done. I'm not being naive. It's it's It could be overwhelming. I will get better at um, sort of documenting what well, we're Well, no, we, we, we will be doing a video every two weeks, yeah. even but, if it's a short one. Well, listen, I'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, of course, everyone's an expert, uh, and, and we're, we're really happy to sort of take people's ideas and, uh, and feedback. And, and answer any questions. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, until, until next time. Glad to have you along for the ride. Yeah. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye for now. Bye.